guys, hello everyone. This is Bada Show again, as always, every Tuesday. I'm welcoming here you on our page, Bada's Empire page, the Queen, uh, Victoria Loskutova, and welcome to the stream, to our live stream again. Bada Show is a raw and real talk show with, with no holds barred. I don't send the questions to my interviewees. Uh, I invite all the best digital professionals that I meet or recommend it to me. And usually it's really, really interesting and great conversation. Please join, ask questions. Today in my virtual studio, I have Brian Dolan, the founder of Verdant.ai, mathematician and an overall great guy. And I'm adding him to the stream. Hey, Brian. Hello. Hi, How thanks for having me. Doing? Thank you for being here today with us. I'm delighted to be. Thanks very much. What's up? How is how is everything in California? Um, oh, whoa, we don't have that much time. Um, California's <laughs> a, from a COVID perspective, it's still a disaster. Um, from a personal perspective, things are not too bad. And I'm, as I was mentioning to you just before the show started, I'm wearing a coat and a shirt today to kind of remind myself that things really aren't that bad for me personally and that that I'm able to uh, enjoy a good life despite this terrible pandemic. So um, I have to kind of remind myself once in a while because it's easy to get depressed when you see the, the things that are happening around us. So sorry yeah. to start on a sour note. No, Ooh, no, everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything we is fine. We all together. You know, we it's, are. Shaking. It's, it's shaking here in Portugal a little bit as well. And I know yeah. that some European countries are starting the second lockdown, which is really pity. And But I mean, what to do? We need to go and move forward and, and stay yeah. positive, right? Yeah. There's still so, good things happening in the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We need to pay attention to good things too. Uh, Brian, tell me what's your story. What is Verdant AI, who you are, what are you doing? Right, um, that's probably useful to your guests. Uh, I'm, <laughs> my name is yeah. Brian Dolan. I'm a mathematician and cyberneticist. Uh, I've been building uh, enterprise grade AI products for about 20 years. Um, the biggest notable, like the, the big things I like to mention in my career is I was the director of research at MySpace for a number of years. Um, I was a, a contractor in the US intelligence community for a number of years. Um, and I started a couple of different health, digital health startups um, that were in you know, various places like fighting cancer or uh, you know, applying things to clinical trials. And now I have Verdant AI, which is our startup studio, um, and we build companies. Um, the idea is we take data plays or artificial intelligence plays and we build them from the ground up. So some founder will come to us and say, I have an idea, this is interesting to me, we'll get it funded, we'll build the product and then we'll go out and um, you know, try to take it to market. So that's what Verdon does. Um, and primarily we're in digital health, but we also have some green energy stuff going on. And we have um, a couple other miscellaneous uh, plays in a variety of fields. One in um, sustainable finance, which is an interesting play as well. Um, and one in addiction and recovery, uh, another one in clinical trials. And uh, let's see what some other ones I should talk about. A couple of enterprise ETL, things that are really, really boring to people who don't do that kind of thing. So that's me. Uh, I build mathy stuff. Wow. What What did you study for that? What did you study math? Yeah. So I didn't intend to study math when I, I, I have a sort of a, you know, a, a strange path through my life, but I intended to study cognitive psychology. When I started college, that was my plan was to study psychology because I was just interested in how the brain works. Um, and so that cognitive psychology has led to uh, neurophysiology, which is my like second or third major, and cognitive neuroscience. Um, and then along the way, when I was at UCLA, they made you take a lot of math. And I just kept saying, I'm just going to take as much math as I can until they fail me out of math. Um, and because it just became interesting. And it's this sort of measure of like, do you understand science? You know, uh, that's how people view it. It's not actually true, but that's how people view it. So I just kept going, got my undergraduate in math, began by that time I loved it. Then I went into graduate school and I got a master's degree in uh, stochastic processes. I, I know um, that you studied quite a lot, yeah? Yes, I have two masters, yes. yeah. 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 
So about all of those at UCLA, one at UCLA School of Math and one at uh, the David Geffen School of Medicine. What so, skills do you need to create AI? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it changes. I think that nowadays really you need, for a while, all you really needed was um, to be able to plug into a couple of open source packages. I mean, a long time ago, you need a lot of math. Then you needed to uh, be able to like hire an engineering friend who will run the same thing over and over. So you're not really inventing, you're just repeating. And now we're getting back to real domain knowledge. So I think the hardest part is finding people who understand the problem well enough to be able to explain what's happening to the AI that you want to build. Um, that's really hard. You know, we're kind of beyond all the easy wins where you can detect a cat in an image or see a bicycle on a road. Those are kind of, I don't want to call them easy, but they're easier than many of the harder challenges, like trying to figure out if a patient has cancer um, based on symptoms, not just an image. So those get really complicated and you need to talk to doctors and figure out what they, uh, you know, what they know that we need to translate into the machine. So sometimes you, you need several educations to start yeah. with AI, right? <laughs> Depends what you want to create. Right, right. You can't, it's not just a general thing where anybody can do any one thing, unless you want to do the easy stuff. Uh, computer vision is very well established now, like being able to look at something and see what's in the picture. Computer vision is really good at that. And that's brought us all these things that make it seem like we've solved it. Like, oh, you can detect somebody's expression. Well, so that's just vision, right? I mean, just vision. It was hard to do the first time, but it's easy to do now. The next thing is like insight, like understanding um, that some children learn differently because of the, uh, the class that they were put in, right? Or even things like, are children not learning because they've been exposed to, um, you know, um, environmental chemicals? Like, how are you ever going to teach an AI to figure that out? Uh, you need domain experts to kind of to help you along. Um, wow. So, yeah, you definitely need cross-disciplinary teams in order to do the, the, the questions that are currently important. So, so that's part of the fun. Yeah, I think I see it's a pretty complex shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, when you, Absolutely. When you decided to, but I also think I also I also know and think that is really really powerful, and uh, that let's get deep into that. So when you when you decided to to create Verdant, what what was your purpose? What did you? Why did you want to do that? Um, well, it remains the same. I mean, the method has changed, but it remains the same. Is that I just like to build cool shit. I like to build stuff that's really hard that other people think is impossible and that will do the world good. You know, I want something that's going to improve the quality of life for as many people as possible. Um, so that's what originally motivated me. It's like, I'm going to find, I'm going to build my own company where all we do is build hard, useful, interesting products. Um, and that's the, the core thesis behind it. And that, that hasn't changed. Like how we go about it and how we get paid in our financial model, all that's changed. But really, if you talk to the team, Everybody works here because they want to do something hard and they want to do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you want to do hard? A simple oh. solution is not enough. <laughs> yeah, no, not really. or, or because AI is uh, complex by itself. Yeah, it's sort of like you, you think you know. Forgiving, forgiving the phrase, please. You know, like you know, do with great power comes great responsibility. And there's only a small, there's only a small percentage of people who understand how to use some of these technologies. Um, so because we do, we should use them. So sure, I could build a web page. Um, sure, I could help somebody fix their storage on their, uh, their laptop, or I could build an app that calls a dog walker, right? I know how to do those things. But the fact is, we know how to do things that are much more complicated. Um, those are very rewarding when you do something really complicated, like, uh, you know, massive text mining. Um, so we should, because we can, we should, and we should use it in the, the proper direction. I'm a little bit recovering from my years as a director of research at MySpace when we did stuff that basically introduced, you know, created too much influence, social media influence. We didn't realize it at the time, but it was really fun to build. And now you're looking back and going, oh my God, you know, like, are we, did we ultimately lead to the polarization? Uh, the political polarization we're seeing in the United States. Uh, so now I'm kind of like, oh, I need to back off from that and, <laughs> and, and find another path. <laughs> Can I go correct that somehow? That'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, so you worked at MySpace, and what are the projects that you work on that are like have famous name? 
Uh, I think, you know, some of the big ones, I was at Yahoo, I was an econometric forecaster there, which was really a different skill set. I had to learn how to predict financial instruments um, and using time series and mathematics. And that was terrifically fun because um, nobody had done it before. Um, and a lot of the things that you encounter are people have this bias that the market acts in particular ways. And so when you come up with an analysis that says, oh, you know, when you pay more, you don't actually get more. When you say that to people who have been selling that you pay more, you get more, um, you get a lot of pushback. And that teaches you really how to make your analysis bulletproof and how to message out to people things that they don't want to hear. Um, so at Yahoo, that was a lot of fun. And I, I had a lot of success. I feel like I had a lot of success there. Um, you know, I was at UCLA as a researcher for a little while. And, um, and I, uh, I, you know, I think I mentioned I was in the intelligence community, basically working with the CIA for a number of years doing text mining for them. Um, and I never had any clearances or classifications, which is uh, actually a reward. <laughs> you know, like, I'm glad I didn't because people would tell me, you don't really want to know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> like, you don't want to hear it. It's really terrible out there. And you want to be, you know, you want to stay as far away from that as possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, Stuart Rogers, Michael Fowler. And I will edit to the screen. Okay. What are the most interesting AI products you've seen so far? Well, it changes every year, right? Because there's always something new. And then what was cool five years ago is no longer cool. So I think that um, when computer vision first started to come out and people were able to do, use like for instance, deep learning to do, to detect the image of a cat uh, in a picture. At first you're like, hey, that's pretty neat. We haven't been able to do that before. Now it's been overdone. So it's not that interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so that's one challenge is that if it's recency makes it cool and in my thoughts, but at the time, how cool was it? Really, really cool. Um, there's also the other thing that confabulates it is so many people are calling their solutions AI when they're not AI. It's just like, it's, you know, what's the definition of AI? I have a theory on that, but I have a thought on that. But, you know, they give you really these banal sort of like we took the average and then we, we you know, extrapolated from the average and they're calling it AI. So a lot of times what you're seeing is not really an AI product. Having said all that, <laughs> um, the, um, the, some of the things that I'm seeing that are really interesting are, um, uh, uh, I really like drones, I like autonomous drones that communicate and act in concert. Like for me, artificial life is one of the more interesting places to be studying where you have, for instance, uh, what's a, it's a company I saw a couple of years ago called Queen Bee Robotics, where they would have a bunch of drones that would talk to each other and communicate and try to solve a problem um, at the same time. And that led to this whole package uh, for virtual reality and for um, animation games called, um, what is that called? I don't remember, but it's within Unity. And they were doing these um, communicating AIs with what they call reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning would have two different agents. One would take an action and the other one would respond to that action. Um, and they would learn to coordinate their efforts uh, through trial and error. So I love those things that mimic real agents in the real world um, that are trying to overcome an obstacle and have to set their own goals. We still haven't gotten to a point where something can set a goal for itself and then figure out how to accomplish it. My favorite example, sorry, I know I'm going on for a long time. My favorite example, <laughs> comes from Terminator, where the Terminator is has come into the world and it somehow figures out that it needs to look in the phone book and find the um, of all the people named uh, Connor and then start calling those. Was it pre-programmed to? Well, of course it wasn't the script, but like the fantasy of what it did is it figured that out on the fly. Um, you know, I really like those sorts of efforts where it observes a problem and it observes a path uh, and then tries to figure out a, a plan to achieve that goal. So that goal setting and achievement, to mo those are the more interesting things. And there's some people who are doing artificial general intelligence who are sort of working down that path, but I don't think they're that far yet. I know it's kind of a non-answer, but it's a complicated <laughs> one of products. <laughs> yeah, I'm always no, happy no, to now, I, I, now I see that uh, you really like complex stuff, so. Yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> like, way more okay, interesting. This, this uh, communicates with this, and, and then you know, uh, they do this and eventually they reach the goal. <laughs> right. 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 It's how we do it in our real lives. You know, we think about what do we want to do today and how are we going to get it done? And that goal setting is fairly independent and, you know, um, um, hard to model. 
uh, with with uh, with current AI techniques. It's hard to sort of model. How do you tell it it wants to do this? If you tell it it wants to do it, does it really want to do it, or do you <laughs> want it to do it? You know, <laughs> it depends on what you want to do. <laughs> right, right, totally. So, okay, for real life, then, how how do you operate? If I can say like that, <laughs> you you. You think more about the future and future goals, or you prefer to live today and work on today's stuff? Well, yeah, also that's changed throughout my career. And right now, since I'm running the company, I spend a lot of time thinking about the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, everything from a simple, especially during COVID, I'm back to having to, you know, buy my own office supplies and run across the street to, to the store to get my own office supplies. So you think about the day-to-day -day operations, you think about the strategy of which members of my team are helping our portfolio companies. We have about four portfolio companies we're really active with right now. And we have a marketing effort to get them all uh, their press releases together. Um, and so you have to kind of think about that. So you kind of get overwhelmed by the operations of it um, most of the time. I do set aside periods of my day um, where I do nothing but, you know, I actually, try to literally turn off my computer and stare at my whiteboards, a whole, whole series of whiteboards along this wall and think about what do I want to build next? Like what is it that other people haven't been able to build that I might want to try? Um, and recently that's been stuff around hypergraphs and um, the notion of complex dimensional matching spaces. So very, very high dimensional things. That thing has a lot of features, that buyer wants a lot of features, they don't quite overlap. How do I make that happen? So. You know, I try to spend it's more some day to day, just right? fantasizing about that. What was it's that? More, it's more day to day. It's now, we're creating now, let's focus on now and let's move on right. day by day, right? Yes. With, you know, you have to deliberately set aside a couple of hours. You have to be willing to go through that feeling of, oh, I should be responding to an email and just say, nope, I'm just going to sit and, you know, on my whiteboard and ignore the world for a couple hours. And I try to do that for probably two to three hours a day, which I don't always accomplish. A lot of times the days get too crazy, but it's there good. is a lot of activity, you know, like operational activity I have to get to. How do you structure your day? Um, well, I know that you have a team, but. Yeah. No, no, the, the, <laughs> How do your team structure your day? Probably the most important parts of my day are the twice a day when I just sit and drink a cup of coffee. And usually that's the first thing in the morning. Um, you know, you check, check your email, make sure that nothing urgent is happening and then close it and put it away, like put it in another room. And I have, I'm fortunate to have this nice window in the front of my house that, you know, uh, I can stare out in this small garden. And that is one of the more crucial parts of the day because you just sit and absorb the, the plan that you have to put together. I'm goal setting at that moment. And I'm thinking about yeah. where do I want to be by 10 o'clock? Where do I want to be in 10 years? Yeah. Um, so that's a big part of my day. And then you get in, you start, first two hours are usually when you're highly caffeinated and you can respond to everybody's email. It's the middle of the day that sucks, honestly. It's like <laughs> from about 11 to two, you're kind of trying to like, what, did I get everything done? Should I be doing something else? That's when it's almost slurry, you know? You feel like you're in quicksand. <laughs> I don't know, in, in the morning, you know, I, I'm not the morning person and my brain just doesn't work properly. So I try to spend time with myself, kind of, you know, journaling and, and, and meditating and doing yoga and have a slow breakfast, slow tea and, you know, mm -hmm. thinking and everything. So, and then 11, 12 is the time like when I, ooh, okay, let's, let's start. Yeah. Let's start. And then, then in a while it's already lunch time. <laughs> but after lunch is like a full force, like after one or two like mm -hmm. let go and crush it and and then six seven is already going slow 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 <laughs> we have members of our team that are like that and i try to be ready for them at around 11 30 they're all full of ideas and they want to talk and i'm like, having my first slump of the day because i've been up <laughs> since like 5 30 or 6 and like okay now you want to talk to me about what's and that's good because you have to provide the energy like a conversation it's just like any other chemical reaction you somebody needs to provide the energy and luckily, you know, you can kind of time your day where I'm low energy, they have energy, we can get enough energy to get through the conversation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a question here. Oh, yeah. Stefan asks, 
are most AI products that are coming to market standalone products or is integration with existing products the market entry? So in the enterprise, you definitely have to integrate. Um, when you're building enterprise, enter, enterprise products, like say you're going to sell something to kind of like a sports league or something, um, like, you know, National Basketball Association, they have a whole bunch of data that they've already been uh, collecting and that they already have tools that they are mining against. So when you're doing an enterprise sale, you definitely want to think about how, what's their tool stack and how does your tool interoperate with their tool stack. If you're doing a direct to consumer sale, like let's say you're doing an, uh, you know some sort of uh, chat bot or some other recommender, um, then those don't really have to integrate as much. You always have to find the data, right? Like, so even like a recommender, like a Yelp or, you know, a restaurant recommender, you have to go get the restaurant data and the other user data. Um, but that could be a fairly self-contained thing if the data collection is coming from Yelp itself. If Yelp is going out and getting the data from another service, then you have that integration point that you have to be concerned with. As an entrepreneur, that's one of the hardest things to kind of figure out when you're um, coming up with your roadmap is how much integration do I have to do? Like I've done big things where I've integrated with hospitals um, and that's a big, big, big effort. But I've also done like more consumer oriented, thing, oriented things like at MySpace where we you know, just served ads. Um, so, but as an entrepreneur, you wanna think what is my integration and then account for the fact that integrating with um, the enterprise level is a lot more expensive and takes a lot more time. Um, I would say that most of the products just by volume are consumer oriented because they're much easier to get to market. Market. So if you're asking about most of the products, then yeah, they're mostly standalone. Um, are they the significant products? It's like, well, are they another dog walking app? Then no. Um, you know, are they are they working to optimize uh, power power usage in a building? Um, you know, that's a lot more work. It takes a lot more effort and a lot more integration, but it's going to have a much bigger impact on society. So I think most in terms of volume um, are standalone. Most in terms of impact are highly integrated with other systems. I hope that All helps. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the answers, guys. I'm happy when you're active. So yeah, uh, nice. please ask more questions. And Brian is here for you. Okay, so recently I have this new format uh, for the show. I have stickers here with different numbers from one to seven because it's my lucky number and because it's all right-ish for the timing that we have. Right. <laughs> so you are free to choose from one to seven. They are different questions, uh, personal and about work uh, and business stuff. And it's, it will be kind of a spontaneous conversation, uh, not so structured, but interesting. I'm, I'm sure of it. So from one to seven, what would you choose? It's hard for a guy who studied probability <laughs> theory to pick a random number, all right? <laughs> I'm having all these like, should I pick from the Fibonacci sequence? Should I go with prime? Should I go with Mercedes? You know, uh, so I'm just gonna pick, um, something without any meaning hopefully and go no i can't even pick six i was going to pick six but it turns out that when people are asked to pick random numbers there's a study they overpick sixes like six <laughs> shows up too much and i was just about fuck it i'm going with six <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> okay six i put it aside what you meant by humanists on the verdance website Oh, so these are tailored so specifically to me. Who, these who, are doesn't like, know, who doesn't know, guys, if you go to verdan.ai, it's literally re written, we are humanists. Why? Why? Because, well, there's a long story to that, and you know everything with me is a long story. So I'll give you the short version. The short version is humanism is really about believing that, that it, at its core, the philosophy is, is believing that humans are capable of it and humans, humans can understand things, right? Like humanism is the center of your knowledge base and you can understand things through the human lens. And when you can't understand it through the human lens, um, you know, maybe it's not knowable. <clears throat> so that, because there's no appeal to a supernatural authority. So humanism is a very sort of scientifically oriented philosophy. Now, more than that, the guy who put together our webpage, the guys at, at Cluj, they're fantastic. They were philosophy majors, so they were like keen, and they, they talked a lot about <laughs> Nietzsche and plus They were really keen to put in a philosophy reference, like a, a classical philosophy reference, because it is uh, onto the website. So they were very excited about it. 
So if I had to go through all the tenets of humanism and had to say I agree with all of them, I'm not sure I do. But the general tenet of believing things through a human lens and through material lenses, uh, I that, that appeals to me. Um, you know, if you want to get into the finer points of it, I'm, I can't do that, right? But yes, um, I mean, I know a lot about Bertrand Russell and such like that. Um, <laughs> but that's where humanism comes from. So we believe in science, basically. We believe in science, we believe in evidence, we believe in the human experience, we believe the human experience is a complicated thing, it is not just rows of data. Um, and that's inspiring to us. And we're also technologists, as it says on the site, you can see it goes back and forth. Um, so we're trying to connect those two worlds. Um, you know, what's cool, what's interesting, what can we know to what can we do? All right, that's a very nice answer. Did you did you say that a lot? <laughs> no, that's the first time anybody's asked me that, honestly. To be blunt. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. I'm I've actually been wondering when that was gonna come up. It's been like years now and nobody's even asked me. <laughs> oh, double <laughs> Yeah, check you out. That's why you're the badass. Right. And I, and I understood from the introduction you're also a queen. So I was like pretty impressed by that. <laughs> well, badass and fire. <laughs> Have a queen. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Next. Yeah. We, so oh, we, I got to go. The way. So from one to no seven. Six. No six. No six. All right. Uh, let's go with three. All right. For no reason. For no reason. Um, who did you want to be in the childhood? Who do I want to be in the what? in the childhood oh yeah so when i was a kid i wanted to be jacques Cousteau. that was like my, one of my big ones i had this weird like a uh, weird duality of what i thought my future was going to be i really wanted to study the ocean i wanted to study sharks but for some reason when i was a kid i always thought but i'm going to end up working in the southwest in a lab someplace and like some military lab deep underground like that was always this weird belief that i had um, and I'm not sure it's ever gone away. I still kind of think like, I'm going to end up in a lab coat in six stories underground someplace. I, you know. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to study the ocean. That was like my, my primary. And I got to do some, um, you know, ecology work as a graduate student. I studied marine ecosystems. Um, and so that was a really great time of my oh, life. Oh, wow. Did you really go like to the ocean with scientists yeah. and stuff? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, had, a, I had a year of my life that, I have the best job ever. Um, my job was to get up at about four o'clock in the morning, um, get into the water, get into the ocean off a, a coastal kelp forest and be 20 feet underwater before the sun came up because we were studying kelp and we had to collect kelp before and after it, it was uh, hit by the sun. So I had to be underwater in the dark as so I go down there. I, it was like an hour away. So I had to like get up really early, get in my scuba gear and get out of the cold, cold water. It was in the winter too, in Los Angeles, but um, <laughs> get down the cold, cold water, sit there in the dark, you know, at the bottom, about 25 feet down and just stare up and wait for the sun to show up. And those were some of the most blissful moments of my life, honestly. Wow, <laughs> that sounds exciting. It was great. It was, wow. it was so great. Nice. I would love to experience that. All right, moving on. Moving on. Uh, am I picking another number? Yep. One. One. I have a bunch of dice, know. but they're not in front of me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I have dice, but they're not in front of me. If I had known, I would have grabbed my dice bag. <laughs> okay. One. What do you suck at, and how do you try to improve? <laughs> uh, giving short answers. Short answers? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was just short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fair. <laughs> um, okay, I've sucked at a lot of things. I think one of the things that if, if this is supposed to be a point where I can give somebody good advice, um, or maybe just advice, um, then I would say the thing I sucked at for a long time was managing uh, and managing technical people. Um, having been a technical person, you often think that you know the your direct reports job and therefore you should do it and correct them and i'm here to tell you don't do that um <laughs> you know trying to understand trying to understand that other people need to make mistakes and go on a path from having a question in their mind and having a frustration and getting through that frustration and then understanding it um, i was very bad at that being patient with people as they learn i don't feel like i got angry maybe i did you have to ask the people i worked with but 
um, I don't feel like I got angry, but I'd be like, oh, well, you're not getting it. Let me show you. And then, you know, feeling like I'm being helpful without realizing that, you know, you only learn things when you have a question in your mind on what you want to know. Um, and if you don't ever develop that question, if I just show you how to do it and you never had a question, like, how do I make a computer beep? Um, if you never ask yourself that and are frustrated by not getting the answer, when I teach you, it won't it won't resonate with you all. It won't inhabit a context of the rest of the learning you have. It'll be this like sort of outlier piece. Okay, can I, one technical fact. The <laughs> definition of, mathematical definition of information is the resolution of uncertainty or re, it reduces to that. So if you don't have uncertainty, you haven't gained information. So if you're not wondering and you haven't struggled with it, you're never going to gain information. You're going to have another fact that you can kind of stick in a drawer someplace that's never going to mean anything to you. Okay. So that wait, I was really so impatient with. On certain uh, things like make me anxious, but how 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 you make it certain? You don't. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. You're going to be anxious. <laughs> And I was like, I want one. Yes or no. Yes or no? Right. Maybe it makes me like. Yeah. Well, maybe you have to ask easier questions, right? <laughs> Am I going to have another sip of coffee? Yes. <laughs> Is it right now? <laughs> no. See now, no uncertainty. <laughs> It's right there for you. So But wait a minute. So what exactly annoyed you in this process with the team? So it was a lack of understanding of that fact that learning is a process and learning is not an instant. Um, I mean, culturally, we're taught, we were taught a lot, at least when I was a kid, so often that people snap out of things, right? Like things happen in an instant. And then in an instant, they fell in love. And then in an instant, they were no longer anxious. And then in an instant, whatever it was. Um, and then one man defied all the odds and made something happen. This is simply not nature, right? Nature doesn't really work like that. But you kind of get it in your, your head that that's how nature works. So when I give somebody a technical task, somebody who's competent, somebody I believe in, and I say, here's your technical task. Can, do you mind putting this together? Um, and they start to struggle with it, not realizing that that struggle is the process, that that struggle is where they gain muscle, essentially. It's not the fail? You mean that it's not the fail, that it's not the problem? It's right, part it's, of the process. Exactly. You're not failing when you're struggling. That's when you learn, right? And that's when you get stronger. Um, when my kids were learning to ice skate, I used to say to them all the time, if you're not falling, you're not learning. And that's absolutely true in something like ice skating, right? Um, you have to fall because that's how you start. your nervous system learns to re uh, react. And not having that patience and not understanding that process for a long time really uh, crippled me as a manager. Um, I have frustrated a lot of my direct reports. Um, and I feel like I was well-intentioned and I think that they all expect that I was well-intentioned, but I would jump in and go like, oh, you should do it like this, you know, and, and that's the wrong way to handle a direct report that you want to develop. If it's like somebody you don't really care about, you should have hired them, number one, but number two, <laughs> then it's fine to <laughs> short circuit their learning, you know, if they're only going to be there for a day and, you know, all you have to do is count beads in a warehouse or something, then fine. But if you want to develop them as a person who can make independent decisions, you have to be respectful of that struggle. And that was a really hard lesson for me to learn. But what? how do you improve? What do you do? Um, well, I had a dramatic event where a guy that I had hired to be my CTO for one of my previous companies, um, mm -hmm. he was a fantastic technologist and a fantastic person, a guy I really like, I still really like, I still really respect. Um, and we just clashed a whole bunch of times. And I would be sitting there in my office going, why am I clashing with Chris? He's, a, you know, I, I, have, I have a lot of admiration for this guy. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that that was the problem. And I didn't honestly realize it until after he quit. <laughs> so that was, you know, oh, I must have fucked something up. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> oh, no. But after that, you, you started to realize, okay, or you talked to someone who, who explained, or you talked to Chris. Um, well, you know, I think I had a lot of conversations. Uh, like you... At that point, I started studying management theory and learning theory a lot more. Um, like I'd already been interested in it because of my interest in cognitive psychology, but but that's when I started really studying what learning means, which has a dual purpose for me, right? Like I can, it's a tax write-off because I studied machine learning, right? So when you're studying learning theory, you're understanding how things learn. Um, and then 
you want to apply that to the people around you. So I talk to a lot of people who are like professional counselors. Um, it's good to have friends who are not in your company, who are like your CEO buddies. It's really good to have those people around because uh, they can give you um, uh, advice on what you might be doing wrong or other ways you can do. Take it away from the negative. They can give you advice on better paths to take, right? If you want to yeah. cast it in a positive light. Um, and hopefully I can provide that for other people. And I definitely have some friends now that, um, especially John Carberry from Future Side uh, Studios. He's a good friend. He's turned into a great business buddy. Um, you know, we don't go out drinking or anything. He's in Toronto. But uh, I love, love talking to him and hearing him say, hey, I tried this and it seemed to work for me. Um, and those are the best conversations to have. So having those conversations constantly and never feeling like you've solved it is another thing. Like, I know I haven't solved management. I know that my team sometimes gets frustrated. I know that, you know, I'm not as operationally efficient as I'd like to be. Um, but I'm trying, you know, everybody's trying. At least the team has high yeah, morale, yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. No. <laughs> I'm the furthest from it. <laughs> but if you're perfect, let's put it to you, let's think of it this way. If you're perfect at something, you must be bored, right? Are you really challenging yourself? And boring, like really good, too. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Challenge yourself, do something harder. It's not like there aren't harder problems for whatever you're good at, right? Even if you're, the, you know, Andre Segovia, maybe the, one of the greatest guitarists to ever live, was reported to have said at 80 years old that he thought he was getting better, right? And by, by this time, by the time he was like 40 or 50, everybody knew that Andre Segovia was the man. Like there was no better than Andre Segovia. Andre Segovia. But at 80, he was still like, I'm getting better. So if you're perfect at something, you've given up. <laughs> Put on your sweatpants and lay in bed all day, right? <laughs> if you're 80, you're like, okay, yeah. now I'm better. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I'll forgive somebody in sweatpants at 80, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two, four, five, or seven? Um, let's go with seven. Seven. Uh -huh. Why uh -huh. some people are frightened of AI? Is that warranted or do they have it wrong? Um, so I yeah, I think that I think that it's easy to displace the fear of the object with the fear of the person wielding it. Um, and you know, not to get into too touchy of a subject, but gun control is a lot on my mind. I believe in strong gun control, but I don't believe that guns are evil. I believe that people will um, you know uh, not correctly will, will unethically wield them, right? Um, and that's why we need gun control. Uh, not because guns are bad, right? Not because hunting is bad, but because, people don't control themselves well with it, and people are not responsible in their use. I feel exactly the same way about AI, that people can be extremely irresponsible in the way they use it. Um, we've seen that again and again from the racism inherent in a lot of these AI routines, you know, identifying every black person as a criminal, uh, that's irresponsible use. Um, and, uh, you know, other things like uh, um, targeting of people, um, there's all sorts of ways that AI is abused. And so I think that, People look at that and go like the AI is a problem and there's no definitive argument against that, but I don't believe that to be true. I believe that AI is also extremely useful in, in doing things like detecting cancer. Um, there's a lot of AI being used in reversing climate change, uh, detecting climate change, right? That was an analytical endeavor in the first place. We know that the climate is changing because of these analytic and mathematical efforts that now might be classified as AI. So I don't think that you want to confuse the tool with the operator, um, but I think it's very easy to do. And I like to forgive people for um, for that. One of the more direct experiences I've seen is when I was in graduate school uh, at UCLA, we had a lot of professors who were better at math than people. <laughs> and so, you know, there was, it was the tendency, the notion was to be like, oh, well, they're, you know, they're really good at math. That's why they can't communicate or that's why they're jerks. And I learned that you don't have to be one or the other. Um, and I saw that in a lot of people. The, the most brilliant mathematician I've ever personally known, a man named uh, Terry Tao, one's that won the Fields Medal. It's a kind of a friend of mine. Like I hung out with him and I, and I liked him a lot. He was one of the most brilliant mathematicians of the past two centuries. You can look him up. Um, he was incredibly nice. He was incredibly friendly. It's very easy to get along with, had natural, easy conversations. So when people would tell me that this professor, well, he's so good at you know abstract algebra, that's why he's a jerk. Um, 
you know, I would say like, yeah, but Terry Tao is better than all of them and he's nicer than all of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, don't give me that. So the operator and the tool are different things in my book. Um, so I think it's good to be wary when you see a use and you go, is that being used correctly? Are the people who are using it ethical? Are they making good decisions? But I don't believe it's the tool itself. But I, I again, I totally understand why people make that connection. Yeah, because it can be misused used against the humanity same like for the humanity mm -hmm. what, what's it, including this one what what is your favorite that you personally created with your team uh, that is for the humanity what's your favorite project what are you working at now yeah uh, so so in terms of you know they're like children I, I know that they're not like children but you like of them all right and they have their strengths in their days and you can't uh, no, say anybody, this is my favorite. Right. <laughs> I love this more and this less. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll tell you, maybe you enjoy. Too right. Much. So there are there are two ways to enjoy a project in my it, for me at least two ways. One is because of Wait the effect minute, it's sorry, having. Sorry, my my. Where are you going? My um, wings uh, interrupt <laughs> me. Your wings? <laughs> are you trying to fly away? The interview's not even over yet. <laughs> They're just like, oh, I can't move. <laughs> okay, I, mean, sorry. Dance. I don't know. It's turned into a TikTok thing. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. Go on. <laughs> sorry. So um, there are two ways I feel like I enjoy different projects. And I'll give you some examples. I'm not trying to dodge the question. But like, one is because of the impact they're having. And one is because the complexity of the problem is fascinating. So for the impact that they're having, we have a portfolio company called Floodlight Invest that is um, looking at very hard to find, very complicated EPA data um, to allow people to invest their money in alignment with their values. So like if you're a, if you're a person with a lot of money and you wanna invest, um, do you wanna invest in companies that are carbon neutral, that are creating APA violations? And that impact is really powerful to me. It's like, okay, part of the problem in the world is that the money is flowing into causes that are irresponsible. So if we can divert the money to go to responsible causes, that's a big pack, you know, and I'm very, I'm very proud of our work there. So that's enjoyable. Um, and we're doing some stuff with an addiction recovery and with cancer trials and all those things like those are ways to enjoy the project. Wow. Another way to enjoy a project is because it's hard. Um, and so we had one that was less impactful. It was working for a sports league, um, trying to understand how they should be doing subscriptions and pricing with this convoluted set of signals. And we had come across these, um, these uh, mathematical methods from the 60s and 70s that were like won Nobel, Nobel prizes, but people couldn't use because they can use it at scales. So, like these really complicated methods, uh, economic models um, that we knew would work, but you can't do in a modern setting because they require too much compute. So we spent a lot of time figuring out how to do that compute and making sure that the, the math actually worked at scale. Um, and that was extremely interesting because the math really works. You know it, it won a Nobel prize. The technology really works. And if you can put those things together, you can have a huge impact on an analysis. So that was also extremely exciting. Uh, so the, the things I've worked on the last, those have both been in the last year. Um, so those are both really fun. Um, I've worked on a lot of really fun things. I mean, I was a mathematical ecologist working on seaweed for a while. So that was extremely, I'm pretty lucky that way. I've had dozens and dozens of really, like things that will wake me up in the morning and go, I can't wait to do this right now. So that's happened to me most of my career. And I feel really fortunate. That's why I'm reminding myself how fortunate I am by wearing a shirt today. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. That's that's what make, make, makes people happy that when you wake up and you're like, I can't wait to start working. Right. Can't wait right. to change the world. It's such a powerful tool. Okay. And you gotta have tricks to remind yourself that you had a day like that yesterday when today you wake up and you're like, I don't feel like it. I want to lay in bed. You go, no, yesterday I was excited to jump out of bed. Uh, why? <laughs> and you have to have those tricks to get yourself back into the group. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, of course, you're like, eh, eh no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. yeah, for sure. For sure. But not today, okay. knowing that I was going to talk to you, I got, got out of bed with, with excitement. So. <laughs> <laughs> Four, five, or two? Um, Let's do powers of two. Let's do two. Two. Um, what AI project? Oh, 
No, you, I just asked that. What AI project excites you the most? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and we're like, yeah, we're running off, uh, out of time a little okay. bit. <laughs> so that's good that I asked that before. Okay, four or five. Four. Um, what is your major fuck up till up to this day? <laughs> up to this day. Um, well, my wife would say not buying flowers enough. Um, and I think that that's probably true. That's one of them. Um, from a personal perspective, I, you know, I, I, it's easy to answer from the professional level. Um, so let me give you like a personal one. All right. Um, I think some of the things I do are really around, um, some of the ways I feel like I fuck up a lot of times are around trying to inhabit the space of the person you're interacting with, like trying to understand where they come from. Um, and I put a lot of effort into it, but I, you know, it's clearly not enough, right? In some situations it is, but mostly it's not. And that's exacerbated by having, you know, two teenagers and, uh, you know, a wife I've been married to for a long time at, uh, in a small house during COVID where you sit there and everybody has a perspective and everybody's going through something as they say, but you often are confronted with a moment and in that moment, no matter how much part of your brain is going, no, 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 inhabit their reality and understand where their reality is before you react. You can't always do that. Um, and when that and, reality clash, you fight. You're like, no, yes, exactly. this is how it should be. And like this, no. And it's hard to understand the, the person that is Absolutely. important to you and that you love, that part of the family. And, it's what what do you do then how you try to understand yeah i mean what do you do i mean there, there's i can't remember yeah, that was not a choice <laughs> right <You can't. laughs> right <laughs> so i'm going to answer that question right now it'll be settled for all time um <laughs> there's this i don't remember where it came from but somebody said um you know seek first to understand and then be understood and it was mm -hmm. somebody like seven habits of highly effective or something that you wouldn't normally find something that I felt was profound. And I kind of try to repeat that self to that to myself once in a while, probably not often enough. Um, that's all I can kind of like shoot for, right? You know, setting goals, right? There's my goal, seek first to understand and then be understood. Um, so I don't feel like I uh, always accomplish that. So as a matter of fact, I had a, a disagreement with my son just yesterday over grades and such like, and I was like, you know what? I could have been cooler. <laughs> you know, I could have been in his headspace better. Um, and if he listens to this, he will definitely have an opinion on that. <laughs> you can tell, tell him, or you can send him a link later. Right. <laughs> and I encourage you to flowers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> home today. <laughs> okay, last question. Um, number five. Mamba number five. Number five. <laughs> Do you consider yourself successful? And what do you think was the roadmap there? I know it can be a really long answer, kind of like some important points that brought you to where you are today. And do you really think, yes, today, now I'm successful? Um, yes, I do think I'm successful. And I think that, but I think the part of the difference between what I have been, what it's only your definition of success, right? When I was younger, there was this sort of fantasy that I was gonna get my degree in mathematics and then everything would be great. You know, oh, and then I'm gonna get my master's in mathematics and everything would be great. And as an entrepreneur, the first time I raise a million dollars, everything will be great. Um, and, you know, well before those things happen, you start to realize that it is the accomplishing of goals that defines success and not, and like success is not a state that you inhabit forever, it is a process. I think everything is a process, right? Everything is a time series. Um, uh, and I think that if you can continue to set goals uh, that are reasonable, that are meaningful and work towards them, that is success. Um, I have had material success in my life in that I've, you know, I was born rather poor and now I'm fairly comfortable, um, you know, and that took a lot of effort. But that state of having, you know, uh, a little bit more material comfort is not the success. Success is the process of knowing that you know you can continue to adapt and strive and and um, and and learn new things and set goals and overcome them. When you get there, you're no more successful than you were yesterday, except that you have another win under your belt. 
uh, and maybe another failure if you've learned from the failure. I've had some really spectacular failures. Yeah, what what if you kind of over, like you were too ambitious, you know that you were on the way, but at some point you don't have enough knowledge. How, mm -hmm. what is your advice to, like if I want to reach the goal, but I don't have, at some point of the, of the, of the way, I don't have enough knowledge, sh like, should it, like how not to give up? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, you want to, you want to continually reevaluate um, your, your goals and how you're, where you want to get to and whether or not you're making progress towards them. So, you know, I describe myself, my background is what they call cybernetics, which is all about control theory um, and game theory. And you know, control theory is about how, once something's in process, how do you keep it in process? How do you keep it from collapsing? And that's what control theory is a lot about. And so goal setting is the same thing. And if you say, hey, I'm gonna change the world, like as a, you know, as a youngster, you wanna like change the world, be a rock star. How do you start that in motion and then keep it in motion? Um, and those for me are all like habits and tricks, like just hacks of how do you keep yourself going every day? Um, and how do you adjust your goals? Like if you're not gonna hit this, if I'm not gonna make, you know, I know a lot of people who, I met a guy who was like, I wanna own a Ferrari by the time I'm 30. I'm like, that's kind of a lame goal, but you know, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, you know, um, as you adjust and you start to understand why do you want that goal? Cause you want some symbol, you want some symbol of wealth. Well, why do you want a symbol of wealth? You know, maybe you could take that if you control that, it's like, I'm shooting for the Ferrari. Okay, great. Why? I want a symbol of wealth. Why do you want a symbol of wealth? Probably an insecurity. Oh, maybe conquering that insecurity is a better goal. And so when people come along and say, you don't have a Ferrari, like how are you, you know, you're 30, you don't have a Ferrari, you failed. You're like, no, no, I conquered that insecurity and that's my success right there. And that's how I kept going forward. You know? What if you just won a Ferrari because- What if you, you just want a Ferrari? You like the car because you like right. it and you can afford yeah. it. Yeah, I think I think that if you want these things, and like I have things that are vanity things. I have a really nice Irish banjo that I that was built in 1920 that I spent a lot of money on that I don't play very well, um, and that's a vanity <laughs> thing. You know? um, but you you those are that's fine as long as you don't attach it to your identity, right? Like I think that your identity needs to be independent of the material objects you own. Um, the material objects you own can reflect the world you want to create around yourself. Um, and like, for instance, I like, I love playing pub music. I like playing Irish music. So I have an Irish banjo and I create a world in which there's music and live music and friendship and, you know, beer going on all the time. Um, and if you have a Ferrari and you want it to have this excitement of like this life of taking chances and, um, and having risk and going out and doing new things and adventures, do that and bring people along in an inclusive way, rather than it's like, I have a symbol of wealth and I'm, you know, I'm better off than you. It's like, yeah, use that Ferrari that you really want to create a better experience for the people around you as well by, you know, having a having an inclusive nature. I think those are good goals for self improvement, and that's then it's not just like oh, you're another Hollywood douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like I like the note we are we are finishing at. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been it's been great talking to you, Thank and you. I think I, I I could talk like forever with you, but <laughs> unfortunately we can't. We can't. And uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for your time. And thank really you for great I see also people enjoy enjoy it, and and and. It's like Stephen uh, wrote again. Yes, that's Stephen Colby. It's probably that's the made, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So all the best. Uh, Thank keep you. Keep pushing and, and grinding in, in, in California. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, it will be ultimately. Science will fix this ultimately. <laughs> I almost you know. like we, we love you. <laughs> <It's like Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank okay, you so yeah. much for having me. I, I really enjoy our conversation. So thanks so much. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Have a great day and uh, say hi to your team. And uh, see you around somewhere yes, in the world hopefully. or online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um,
Guys, thank you for being here, for joining me uh, here today for Better Show. Better Show is a raw and real talk show with no holds barred. I interview badass digital professionals, digital entrepreneurs from all over the world to hopefully inspire you and uh, that can inspire you and, and give you some ideas how you can improve, grow, um, work with your team or be just a great person. And uh, I want to remind you that we just launched uh, Better Times. Better Times is the first ever online publication for digital nomads uh, with a social network built in it. So think Facebook, think Medium, think Vice, not the New York Times. You can come there, submit your story, register, add friends, uh, brag about your, sh your shit, your stuff, your projects, and uh, educate other digital nomads. So go to badasstimes.com, check it out, and join the community. And if you want to be interviewed, feel free to message, comment under this interview, or DM me, PM me, and let's do this. And I'll see you next Tuesday, every Tuesday, here on Facebook, Badass and Pie page. See you around, and don't forget, don't be a dick.